Hello, welcome. This is my first ever live stream on my own. So apologies for the rustiness, but hopefully in the future, I will get better. So hello, good people. Hello, people watching it now. I see there might even be two people already here if you have introduced yourselves. Uh, and hello, people watching this in the future. I am Sean Hotchkiss. I am a cosmologist. Uh, I am a part-time research fellow at Auckland University. And this is a channel where we will try to go into the trenches of cosmology. So what I mean by that is the places where the actual research is being done rather than just showing polished final products of research. We might also show polished final products of research, but yeah, what are the individual papers that are coming out? Not just what are the big results that normally make the news. Uh, so that's what to expect from the channel today. What to expect is I will briefly go over some of the most popular papers of today. I'll do it for the last year because this is the first stream. So I can do that on a, on a web page called Benty Fields where cosmologists, some cosmologists run journal clubs. And then these journal clubs, people can vote for what paper they want to, to talk about it in a journal club. So ordinarily, I think in my streams, I'll go over the, the most popular ones from the last week, just as a kind of intro while people drift in to the to the stream. But today, because we're starting the first one ever, we can do most popular from the last year. And then today, what I'll do is I'll go over a specific paper, which uh, I'll introduce later on. Uh, but that specific paper is on the early universe, specifically inflation and trying to learn about inflation without assuming a model of inflation, a specific model, trying to be as model independent, as agnostic as possible about what the correct model is. So we can get started now with the Benty Fields most popular papers of the last year. So let's see if I can do this correctly. Hopefully I can. That wasn't good. We'll remove that. Okay, cool. All right. So hopefully you now see this on your screen. So what this is, is the uh, most popular papers as voted by cosmology journal clubs. I've tried to filter this down to just cosmology, but it also has a little bit of extra galactic physics, which I might not be quite such an expert on. So I'll, I'll have to skip over those papers, but I'll just briefly talk about what these papers were meant to be about and why people perhaps found them interesting. Do this for about 10 minutes and then I'll get into the specific paper. I'm, aiming to, to talk about today. So this number one, most voted over the last year to H naught or not to H naught. I think there's two reasons why this was heavily upvoted. First of all, it's on this, this thing H naught. The H naught tension is the probably most discussed thing in cosmology at the moment. It's a discrepancy between the measured expansion rate by a thing called the distance ladder, which is where people try to to measure how fast the universe is expanding using supernovae that they calibrate using something called Cepheids, uh, which have a specific relationship between their, their period and their brightness. So you can see how far away they are based on that. There's otherwise there's, there's a common degeneracy, like an issue in measuring how fast the universe is expanding, which is that you don't know whether an object is further away or is dimmer because it's further away or just intrinsically less bright. Uh, but Cepheids allow you to, to know how bright they should be by how fast uh, this periodic brightening is. And then you calibrate the supernovae using the Cepheids because there's more Cepheids, but they're dimmer. So you can't see them very far away. Fewer supernovae, but they're brighter. So you can see them further away, but you need to calibrate them based on the Cepheids. Uh, so H naught is intrinsically interesting. And as you can see, all three that are currently on your screen, the H naught or not to H naught, the Hubble tension bites the dust, a new measurement of the Hubble constant. So the top three voted cosmology papers of the last 12 months are all on H naught. This one maybe got to the top because of the author of the paper, Georgia Statio is a relatively prominent cosmologist uh, professor at Cambridge. Uh, and also someone who is very prominent in the Planck uh, satellite collaboration who are the, the kind of source of tension with this local measurement using supernovae. They 
the Planck measured the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, and from that inferred what the value of H naught should be, the, the, the expansion rate, given the standard cosmological model. So people obviously wanted to hear his opinion. I, I have a paper here. It's not this one that was highly upvoted. I guess it's more than a year old now, so it's slipped off the, the top of the last year. It was also by George Statio, and I really like this paper, or at least one particular aspect of it, because it has comments from the SHOES team. So SHOES is, I think, supernova, I'm not going to remember this acronym, supernova H naught, something, something. Uh, and, but they're, they're so, so they're Statio's leading competitor here. They're, they're the local measurement, and, and he's the Planck satellite, the CMB, the, the prediction. Uh, and so he wrote this paper, and in version one, it was just his thoughts. And in version two, he's included comments from the shoes team. So they obviously got in touch with him, said, we disagree with this, or we agree with that. And then he's added in, here we go, response from the shoes team, thoughts from these uh, other people who, who probably disagree with him with a lot of, of the things he said. So it's quite nice that, that he did that. So he has all of his kind of comments on what he thinks maybe they've done wrong. And then they've got their response saying, actually, no, we think we did it correctly, blah, blah, blah. I'm a big fan of any, basically anything that is trying to innovate within the way science is done. So even this very small innovation of literally putting space in your paper for your, not opponents, but like people who might disagree with you to have their say, I really liked. So I think this was previously the most popular paper until of the last year until the last year uh until the last year no longer until it was no longer within the last year hello paul uh a single author paper is rare yes i think re relatively rare they're not they're not like exceptionally rare i have one single author paper i think of somewhere between 20 and 30 papers in total i think both of the these papers by george this one that is still within the last year and then this one that i was just talking about are single author perhaps because he wanted to be a little bit more sincere and bold in what he was saying and he didn't want to check with the whole plank collaboration he just wanted to say look this is what my thought is um normally when you have an idea you kind of talk with your friends and colleagues and a, a collaboration kind of forms it it's not super common that you have an idea that goes from idea to completion all the steps of the way without someone else helping out enough that you you end up with a, a co-authoring and, and it's it's more fun working in teams and it is normally better because you, you share ideas the one single author paper i had was essentially because i it, it was a little bit of a counteract counter to prevailing wisdom and most of the people who were also working on that topic i couldn't convince that this was correct so i just wrote it up uh it turned out it, it was correct and and the community came to my way of thinking eventually but yeah i'm not sure why other people have ended up with single author papers but that was my specific story ah so the, the second one here the hubble tension bites the dust is again on the hubble tension and it is this group of authors were were talking about how perhaps the siffy color calibration so one of the steps of this distance ladder in in working out how far a siffy how far away a siffy is might have been done wrong and so their claim was that the local measurement is is too big because this this calibration was done wrong so again that's why that's popular i i think the shoes people have their own response to this so it's not that this paper got written and okay that's the solution to the hubble tension i think the shoes people don't agree that this is a, a solution but it is certainly a leading possibility that somewhere or another the local measurement is not correct but in some very subtle way that is not obvious to them or to anyone else that um it, it might not end up with new fundamental physics in explaining the hubble tension but it might end up with some sort of new astrophysics that i mean was, that was to be super super interesting that some subtle effect we're missing uh the next one and i was going to do 10 but i see i've already taken 10 minutes so i will probably move on from this after maybe five Next one, a new measurement of the Hubble constant using fast radio bursts. So uh, again, Hubble constant is expansion rate. Fast radio bursts are these interesting observational things where you get a very short 
burst of radio frequency electromagnetic radiation from a particular part of the sky and this is useful for measuring the expansion rate again you, remember you always have this problem with measuring the expansion rate and that you don't actually know how far away something is you can you can measure how fast it's receding really normally quite easily by measuring its doppler effect that that just the same way when when a car is driving past you you hear this doppler effect that when it's coming towards you you hear a and then as it goes past it goes you just like that with uh light you get a change in the frequency and so you can measure how fast something's moving away from you by by this doppler shift but you don't know how far away it is because it could be dimmer intrinsically or it could just be further away so you always need some sort of clever way of measuring that distance before you can measure the expansion rate and actually i'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here this is something that i always wonder why people don't ask the question of like why is distance important here surely an expansion rate is constant everything's moving away at the same speed but it, it doesn't work that way because the universe is homogeneous so the same everywhere you actually need to be expanding faster from something the further away from you further away from it you are and that's important because otherwise there would be some center to the universe right like if we were the center and everything was moving away from us at exactly the same speed that would be fine if if the universe wasn't homogeneous if it wasn't the same everywhere if we were somehow special but if you want to set up a situation such that wherever you go in the universe everything will look like it's moving away from that point then you need to have the situation where the bigger the distance is between things the faster it's expanding now i one of the things I want to do with this channel is when I come across an idea like this that I think isn't super well expressed, I want to sit down and make some illustrations and maybe even pay someone for an animation if I have enough of an income from this uh, project to, to further explain that idea. So if you're watching this now or in the future and you like that idea of going deeper into why having a homogeneous universe, so having the universe the same everywhere, needs this kind of expansion rate rate that the velocity of things increases as you move further apart then then let me know uh, and i'll go into it so fast radio bursts become useful for measuring the expansion rate because there's this thing called a dispersion measure that the further away a fast radio burst well as the light from the radio burst travels through the universe it interacts with free electrons in the universe and it gets dispersed that different frequencies in, inside this radio burst so they're all radio frequencies, but they have different, you know, different radio frequencies. Uh, will get dispersed more or less. I forget which way it goes. I think the higher frequencies get less dispersed, so they travel slightly faster than the lower frequencies through this medium. But that means that you can look at a galaxy where a fast radio burst is coming from and be ah, okay, I know how far away that is because I know how much the radio burst got dispersed, how much it got widened. And the, the crucial difficulty here is isolating which galaxy a fast radio burst came from. And once you've done that, you can measure this redshift, you can measure this Doppler effect, you can see how fast something's moving apart. And I think these guys had about seven fast radio bursts that could be isolated to a galaxy. And therefore they got this, this first measurement. It wasn't a very precise measurement, had a very large error bar so it's actually consistent either with the more precise choose supernovae and Cepheid measurement or with the Planck prediction but it was a first step that in the eventual future once many different um fast radio bursts have been localized we'll be able to more accurately measure it and in, in fact i remember if you go to today's papers on the archive there is in fact an 8% determination of the Hubble constant from localized fast radio bursts. So even in the time between whenever this paper was published some number of months ago, April 2104, so 2021, fourth month, and now there've already been a better measurement of the Hubble constant from fast radio bursts. So I imagine if we were doing this again in a few months that this paper might be higher up the, the hierarchy. Cool, okay, uh, I will I will stop there there are some other interesting papers in this in this top 10 the end of galaxy surveys i'll just go super fast is 
talking about how there's a limited number of galaxies essentially that we will see in the sky and once we've seen them all that's the end of galaxy surveys so there's, so there's some finite amount of information we will learn by looking at the locations of galaxies in the sky and then it'll be the end of galaxy surveys this is a problem that cosmology faces that essentially we have a finite amount of information available to us and we can keep getting cleverer and cleverer in how we extract that information but we don't have the power that an experimental science has where we can just redesign experiments over and over again we can't build a bunch of new galaxies to see how they might evolve we can watch how the galaxies that do exist have evolved but we can't build new ones this camels project is a really cool thing it is an application of machine learning to cosmology so what they've done is they've run a whole bunch of different simulations of galaxy formation and galaxy evolution and how this initial universe that is very homogeneous it doesn't have very large density fluctuations can evolve into a universe that has galaxies planets people although they wouldn't be simulating at the uh, at the level of planets and people uh so they do a bunch of simulations and then they calibrate a machine learning algorithm on these simulations to be able to predict given certain fundamental parameters so, so all of these simulations they've run have slightly different fundamental parameters slightly different amounts of dark matter slightly different amounts of dark energy slightly different sizes of initial fluctuations in the density of the universe slightly different expansion rates and then they use this machine learning algorithm to look at aspects of what the final universe looks like and predict what these fundamental parameters were and so for their training data of course they know what the fundamental parameters were because they ran the simulations but then what they're able to do is this algorithm is able to then be given the final result of a simulation so so something like a, a map of galaxies on the sky and say ah okay based on the training data and my training of my machine learning algorithm i can now predict that the fundamental parameters were so and so and that's useful for a couple of reasons although it's a slightly dangerous thing i know i said i was going to go through this quickly hopefully i'll get around to actually talking about the paper i wanted to talk about but I, hopefully also this actual going through these most popular papers is, is itself interesting uh the, the camel stuff is interesting for two reasons one reason is that it allows you to explore this parameter space of fundamental parameters without necessarily having to run lots and lots and lots of simulations you might run a simulation with the amount of dark matter at value 0 0.2 of the you know 20 percent of the total density of the universe in dark matter and then another one at 25 percent but if the actual universe had it at say 22 percent you might have to then just keep running simulations more and more precise to get closer and closer to that value but if you have a machine learning algorithm that can tell you what the universe would look like halfway between the two values you've simulated you might not have to actually do the simulation as i said this is dangerous because there might be reasons why the interpolation the machine learning is doing is not correct in some subtle way you didn't understand and if you do under if you do run a simulation you understand what the simulation is doing the whole point about machine learning is it's kind of doing something sneaky underneath the tin that you don't fully understand if you did fully understand it you wouldn't need machine learning so one always has to be careful but th there's the hope that, that it might do that the second thing i think that machine learning can do is it can find sources of information we might not have already been aware of so in the same way that alpha go can play chess better than a human being and play some move and then the grandmasters of the world will be like why is that a good move and then go away and analyze it and find out ah, it was a good move for the following reason um in some subtle way i've undermined one of the pieces and will eventually be able to attack it we might discover that some observable that we can look at in the universe that we thought wasn't that interesting the machine learning algorithm has said ah no when this value is slightly bigger i know that the dark matter density is slightly smaller and we'll be like whoa okay i i, I don't know how you know that but it seems to be some pattern in the universe and then we can go and study that so it's it's not telling us that in the real universe some fundamental parameter has some different value to what we thought but it is telling us some observable is really interesting and so we can learn about fundamental physics that way uh i'm going to stop now but there are, are other interesting papers here if you want to learn about cosmological simulations of dark matter and quantum computers i can talk about that another day 
this thing here is again h naught the expansion rate and I, I think this one was relating it to the age of the universe which is which is interesting this one was a huge undertaking uh, the dark energy survey the year few results that came out this year and their constraints on cosmology from these two observables galaxy clustering and weak lensing which are both very very interesting things so if you want to learn about all of that sort of stuff you want to come back and listen to me in, in future weeks i promise i will announce things in advance in the future i was a little bit nervous about the stream so i've made it deliberately under advertised just so that i can get through it and the world won't blow up my computer won't explode and i will be more confident in future ones so stick around and you will you will know a future broadcast in any case this is recorded so you're probably watching this later on cool so the uh can i get myself back on full screen i can so th the main point of today is to talk about an individual paper i think this is an important thing to do because this is how the research actually is produced and shared amongst researchers but it's not how almost anyone shares it with the general public the people who aren't the active researchers and of course the main reason why no one does that is that it's extremely difficult to digest a a paper in a way that can be understood by a non-expert. I mean, even an expert can't just pick up a paper and be like, ah, okay, I get totally what this is talking about. It takes quite a lot of time to, to digest. So I'm not saying that other people are uh, like somehow morally wrong for not trying to do this. And I think a whole ecosystem should exist where people are talking about the more general stuff all the way down to the nitty gritty. I like to think about this in a kind of sports metaphor quite often where you will have people who are only commentating on or watching the final of the Olympics or the final of Wimbledon of tennis or something. But then there's also people who are watching, you know, their local club games of whatever sport and really getting into the details of how the sport is played. So the trenches of cosmology, we want to get into the details. In fact, we, we want to cover the, the whole spectrum, but that includes the details. So again, with a sports metaphor, it's a bit like when you have a kind of sports league, the final result is itself interesting and it's built up on a whole bunch of individual games. So each individual game is not necessarily going to be very exciting and groundbreaking but in order to understand why i don't know liverpool was at the top of the table i don't know who's at the top of the table i'm not even sure what the sport football is but let's pretend liverpool is at the top of the table in order to understand why they're at the top of the table you want to go back and look at all of the individual games but yeah i, I think one thing i want to warn people about today is don't expect that i'm talking about a paper and it will be as groundbreaking as, as perhaps you're used to it's not going to be wow and therefore the conclusion is that we have to throw away dark matter or therefore the conclusion is that we've finally proven that dark energy is so and so it's more going to be okay here's some small iterative step just like an individual game in a sports league some individual step iterative step that takes us slightly closer to understanding some particular topic uh, unfortunately i have accidentally been incredibly ambitious today and this is a very very technical paper the reason i've chosen it anyway is that i actually am the curator and interviewer of a technical cosmology talks channel and i will share my screen again cool called uh cosmology talks and so yeah cosmology talks and these are talks that are aimed at cosmology researchers about recent papers and the way i do it is that i kind of interview the the researchers they go through some slides i ask some questions but i thought that it would be a perfect opportunity to kind of match that project this cosmology talks project aimed at researchers with this project trenches of cosmology looking at the the nitty-gritty by whenever i upload one of these pa papers one of these videos i then discuss the paper here in a live stream and people can ask me about the paper or, or video and 
I can I can talk about it. So the most recent one published 18 hours ago, Unitarity Constraints on Cosmological Correlators, uh, valid in any flat FLRW metric, if you could see the rest of the title, is on an extremely technical uh, paper. But I don't know, I, I'm ambitious and, and I think even these extremely technical papers deserve or should be talked about to, to, to everyone. So if you are a fan of cosmology and are very bold and courageous, I hesitate to say the word recommend, but I would suggest maybe checking out the videos on this channel. They are slightly more digestible than your typical technical cosmology talk because they do have a kind of interview nature. And if the speakers get too technical, even for cosmologists, I jump in and ask some questions. So it might be that you, you can digest them slightly better. But anyway, we're, we're talking about this specific paper, uh, this specific video today, which is based on this paper, Cutting Cosmological Curate Correlators. Harry Goodhue and Gordon Lee were the two people who, who were in that specific video. So this uh, paper, yeah, I'll show you why, why I'm being ambitious, actually. That's why I have the PDF here. In the future, I think one of the things I'm going to be quite keen to do is to, to look at the actual figures in the paper and kind of digest for you what the figure is showing and say, this figure is talking about this thing on the y-axis, this thing on the x-axis. This is why these things are interesting. But if we just casually scroll through the paper, we see a lot of equations. Uh, this figure, which is not a figure about two observable quantities, it's, it's a kind of digestion of exactly what their method is, is trying to do. And I think that might even be the only figure in the paper. There might be another figure just like that one, actually, or similar to it. But more equations, more equations. So why not start bold and ambitious? Let's try and digest exactly what Harry, Sadra, Gordon, and Enrico were, were, were trying to tell uh, the universe or tell, tell cosmology. So, right, where am I up to? Okay, all right, all right. Now I'll, I'll take a step back from that paper. Okay, well, no, first of all, I'll just quickly talk about what the paper is actually trying to, to do. Let me just get myself back on full screen. So it's talking about a framework called inflation and trying to say, given inflation, so it's not saying we know inflation is true. It's just saying let's let's for the purposes of this paper assume inflation is true. What can we say about final observable stuff that is model independent or as model independent as possible? The reason why this is interesting or useful is that there are lots and lots of models of inflation that can be produced, but it's difficult to then sort of say what is it that inflation itself can generically produce. Now, as I warned you earlier, this is not going to be a final conclusion that okay this is exactly what inflation says it's just that's the motivation and the goal behind the kind of theme of the paper but it, it's just a, an iterative step along that theme it's not from beginning to end the entire thing now the way they do this is by requiring some very fundamental principles to exist during inflation so it's not 100% model independent. It's still saying this physical principle must exist and then saying what are the what are the conclusions or the consequences for particular observations. So yeah, just going into a bit more detail about why this is why this is interesting or, or a useful thing to do. Theoretical physicists are notoriously good at building models that seem compelling to human beings. And I think this is one of the things often goes wrong in science communication when someone who came up with a model is the one doing the communication because it is very easy to make these models seem correct because you can make them seem compelling but there are 99 or 999 other models that are not possibly like you can't have those other models and this model correct at the same time for which you could create an equally compelling argument or story as to why this model is correct now eventually of course observation rules the day 
and models make predictions and the ones that make false predictions get ruled out. But when you're dealing with a field like cosmology, where, as I said earlier, you have this problem that you can't create experiments, you can just observe what's there in the sky. But also when you've reached a stage where the science is sufficiently advanced that in order to make new observations, you can't just, you don't have citizen scientists with their telescopes in their backyards anymore observing stuff. You have billion dollar experiments putting things in space. You have tens, twenties collaborations of people, or 10 or 20 people analyzing the results of telescopes on earth. You have collaborations of hundreds analyzing the results of telescopes on earth. It's not so easy to gain the data that will rule in or out models. And inflation is especially difficult here because it happened very, very early in the, in the universe. I, I'm going to go into detail about what inflation is in a second, but it makes it even more difficult. So you can't tell the difference by observation yet, which model is correct, but you also can't tell by theoretical reasoning because we're easily persuaded and it's not necessarily true that some line of reasoning leads like the history is full of at least scientific history is full of very compelling models turning out to be wrong so even if there's some model of inflation that is more compelling than others it's not therefore definite that it's true so what one can try and do instead is take an entire framework so here inflation would be the whole framework and say what fundamental principles do we think must be satisfied and then go from there and say if this principle is satisfied and inflation is true what observational consequences must there be and the, the idea behind this is that therefore any model that is constructed to fit the framework of inflation and that satisfies this fundamental principle will also make this prediction and if it doesn't satisfy that fundamental principle then either it's wrong or that fundamental principle is wrong and it would have to then sort of explain why this fundamental principle doesn't work so we'll go into detail uh, hopefully as well about what fundamental principles we're, we're talking about here uh as i said i've been quite ambitious the, the the fundamental principle here we're talking about something called unitarity which is not going to be a trivial thing to explain and i'm going to do an attempt today and then i'm going to go in i'm going to think about it in a lot more detail and in some future stream weeks or months from now i'm going to have a better go at explaining what unitarity is but that's their fundamental principle, unitarity. It's got something to do with kind of information not being lost from the universe, that probability is conserved, but we'll get into that in a second. The framework is inflation. And then the observable stuff that they're trying to link to at the end are correlation functions, which I'll also go into in a bit more detail in a second. But they're things that we can look at in maps of where galaxies are in the sky and this cosmic microwave background, which comes from the early universe. And... We can measure correlation functions in that. And then this theme of this paper would then say, okay, if you've determined, measured certain things about your uh, blah, 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 correlation function, this is either consistent or inconsistent with framework plus fundamental principle, which in this case is inflation plus unitarity. Cool. And yeah. So now let, let's get into the details. We've got three things we need to we need to think about. Inflation, which is the framework. Unitarity, which is the fundamental principle and correlation functions. So for a little bit of time, I will try and digest what each of those three things are. And then we'll bring it all together and say, why does this framework have anything to do with this observable? And why does this fundamental principle perhaps say something about it? Although the fundamental principle part, again, I'm going to, I'm going to really struggle with today. Unitarity is, is not a trivial thing to, to digest. So inflation. Inflation is this idea that in the very, very, very early universe. So as I talked about earlier, the universe is currently expanding. If we run the universe backwards in time, it is not expanding, it is contracting. And one consequence of it contracting is that things are getting more and more dense. The temperatures are heating up because of that, because stuff is more energetic. As, as things are expanding, their relative velocities appear to be slowing down uh, for, for most of the universe's history. At the moment, that's accelerating again due to probably dark energy, but 
we won't go into that today. Running the universe backwards in time, things are getting hotter. Eventually you get so hot that you are getting hotter than anything we can measure on Earth. Even in something like the Large Hadron Collider, where we accelerate protons to as fast as at the moment is technologically possible, which is a very, very high energy. If you go backwards in time in the universe far enough, you get above that energy. The idea of inflation is that at large enough energies, there's a kind of phase transition in the universe and it stops being full of the stuff that we are familiar with, which is radiation, matter, stuff like that, and is full of something much more similar to what we're now observing, this, this dark energy stuff. And this other stuff, this inflaton, this inflation field, would cause the universe to be accelerating in its expansion. So now to kind of press, re press play again and go forwards through the history of the universe. During inflation, you have an expanding universe that's accelerating in, in, accelerating in its expansion. At some point, there's a phase transition and inflation ends, and the universe goes to being dominated by hot radiation. And then that is now an expanding universe that is decelerating in its, in its expansion because gravity is normally attractive and everything that's expanding is attracting itself and, and slowing down. Then you come to a matter dominated phase, which is dominated by dark matter and ordinary matter. And then we enter the current phase, which is not super well understood, but somehow accelerated expansion again. Within the model of general relativity, which is the current best model of, of gravity, this concept of inflation is, is a completely acceptable and possible thing. When you have a, a field permeating the universe who has a constant or nearly constant energy density. So in another stream on another day, I'll talk about why that happens and why that's possible. But the crucial thing to, to take away today is that inflation is possible within general relativity. Not that it, it's not requiring any modifications to our theory of gravity. What it requires is a new physical field, a, a new type of particle or you know, fields. We have electric fields, magnetic fields. We have the electron, we have the quarks. So you'd need something new on, on that side that is has this constant vacuum energy, but gravity itself doesn't need changed. So that's one thing you take away. Gravity doesn't change, but you need some new field. And it has this accelerated expansion. Now, the accelerated expansion is, is quite important to today's topic because it is what allows there to be um, the creation of small fluctuations in the density of the universe on different distance scales. Now, let me try and digest for you why that is the case. The reason why it's important is that this comes into this correlation function thing. So I said there are three things I'm going to digest. The framework, which is inflation, the fundamental principle, which is unitarity, and the observation, which is a correlation function. So the correlation function is measuring how things over different patches of the universe relate to each other, in particular, perhaps the density or the temperature. And inflation is what is creating these things. So let's consider two pieces of the universe in an accelerating expansion. So what I mean by accelerating expansion is that the velocities between these two objects as they move apart is actually increasing. Um, if there's a decelerated expansion as they move apart, their velocity is, is decreasing. Now, I can imagine someone who's paying, paying a lot of attention throughout this entire stream, stopping and being like, hold on, hold on. You said earlier that things when things are further apart, they're traveling faster. How can that be true if you're now saying in a decelerating expansion, as things move further apart, they th their velocity decreases? Those two statements are simultaneously correct in the sense that, okay, if I have a snapshot of time at a fixed time, as I move to further and further and further distances, the velocity between two areas is increasing. So if I'm here and I move to here, this thing is moving away faster than this thing, which is moving, sorry, this thing is moving away slower than this thing, which is moving away slower than this thing. As I move further away, things are moving apart faster. And in a decelerating expansion, as the thing is moving away, it's slowing down how fast it's moving away. 
but the thing further away is also slowing down but gets this initial faster velocity now in an accelerating expansion it's still true that in a fixed point of time as i move further away the things are moving faster away from me but also as i go forwards in time two individual pieces of energy or or field in the universe are also moving apart faster and faster so this is crucial because it means that at some point as these things are moving apart eventually they'll be moving apart so fast that they can no longer interact if this thing over here possibly off the camera this thing over here emits some light signal it's moving away so fast that that light signal will never get to this thing here and vice versa if this thing's emitting light it'll keep moving towards the other thing but it'll never get there because the other thing's moving away too fast so what this means is that stuff that is true when this too far apartness happens gets kind of fixed any correlation anything that this piece of the universe knows about this piece of the universe gets stuck in time it can't change there's no possibility of interaction so i'll have to leave it at that i would love to go into more detail about what these things are that are getting fixed in time they have to do with initial quantum fluctuations that get stretched their wavelength gets stretched as the universe expands and then they get amplified when inflation ends it's super interesting and super exciting stuff so subscribe come back uh i'm sure eventually i'll get around to, to talk about that in more detail but for now the idea is just that as this accelerated expansion is happening certain correlations are getting imposed upon the universe and fixed until they're measured later on so that is that is the relevant part of inflation uh let's move on to correlation functions next because they're <laughs> the easiest thing and you, you know hiding from unitarity so a correlation function is actually a relatively straightforward thing there is a two-point correlation function which is saying if i have two points of the universe let's say this point and this point and i know say the density at this point or the temperature at this point the two-point correlation function tells me some probability distribution about the density or temperature at this point in full generality a two-point correlation function would be a would have a three-dimensional argument like the the that's a technical term it would have a three-dimensional you'd need to okay let's start again in full generality the two-point correlation function would depend on the actual location of both of the points so it would matter whether i'm up here or over here or wh whether the, the other point is here or over here but in a universe that is on average again this this word homogeneous so on, on average it's the same everywhere and now a new technical word isotropic so it looks the same in every direction and these are two subtly different things i'll explain why you could have something that is moving in this direction in the whole universe is moving in this direction like every piece of material is moving that way so the stuff here is moving that way 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 and stuff here is moving that way this is still a homogeneous universe but it's very far from isotropic if you're anywhere in the universe and you look this way you see stuff moving away from you and if you look this way you see stuff moving towards you so it's not isotropic at all but it is homogeneous on the other hand you could be sitting at the center of a universe where in every direction you see exactly the same thing but it could be some spherically increasing density every new sphere is somehow increasing in density so it's still isotropic every direction you look it's the same it's only isotropic for you it's not isotropic for anyone else uh but it's not homogeneous but okay if you have a universe that is both homogeneous and isotropic looks the same everywhere sorry is the same well is is on average the same everywhere and looks the same in every direction then this two-point correlation function only depends on the distances between things which is kind of straightforward to see like if, if the universe is the same everywhere it doesn't matter where my reference point is because it's the same everywhere statistically and then if it's isotropic it doesn't matter whether the point i'm now trying to predict is over here or here or here or here or here or here the angle doesn't matter but of course if i'm further away it might be different to if i'm closer so the two-point correlation function then becomes a function just of the distance between the two points and you can maybe start to see how knowing about inflation becomes something that 
helps you to know about this correlation function because as I was saying before in inflation as the accelerated expansion is causing stuff to get further apart and eventually not be able to interact stuff gets frozen in so then later on in time when this after a decelerated period when the stuff that's far apart starts to come back into causal contact it starts to be able to interact with each other again you start to be able to look in one direction and in the other direction and see these two pieces that whatever was frozen during inflation has now become a measurable thing um, so that's a very heuristic way of understanding how inflation relates to correlation functions. Now, I've just talked about the two-point correlation function. There's also three point, four point, five point, six point, seven point, eight point, nine point, ten point correlation functions. N point correlation functions where n can take any value. Um, a three-point correlation function is exactly what it sounds like. You have this point, you have this point. And then I only have two hands, but if I had a third hand, I'd put my third hand here and say a third point. So in that sense, it then becomes a function of triangles, right? You've got the three points. So two-point correlation is just a distance. A three-point correlation function is a triangle. And the homogeneity and isotropy comes in here in the sense that the triangle doesn't have to be anywhere. It's a specific point in space. You don't say, oh, the triangle that's over here is different to the triangle that's over here. All triangles are equally wherever they are in space equally relevant and then isotropy means the kind of orientation of the angle stops up the little of the triangle stops mattering you you just a three-point correlation function just depends on the shape of the triangle so an equilateral triangle might have a different three-point correlation function to an isosceles triangle but an equilateral triangle that is like this is going to be equivalent to one that's like this or like this or like this or like this or in a different point in space. And just like with the two-point correlation function, distances matter, so the size of the triangle is also relevant. And equally, this applies to four-point correlation functions. You just have a, uh, not a rectangle, but a, a quadrilateral. Is that the, <laughs> yeah. What's the, <laughs> what is the technical term for a four-sided figure that isn't, doesn't have right angles like a rectangle? So it's not a rhombus or a, or a parallelogram. I think it might be quadrilateral, four-sided figure. If there's anyone actually watching this uh, comment, and let me know, and I'll uh, I'll say it out loud. I'd be very thankful. But you then you just have a four-sided figure, again, where it is in space and what its relative orientation is doesn't matter. Trapezoid, yeah, maybe. Or is it? I'm going to Google that. Sorry, I'm going to be distracting for a second. Um, is a trapezoid something that is uh, has specific angles, or is it just? I think a trapezoid has the specific, like they, the top and bottom are parallel to each other. So it might just be quadrilateral. Let me go quadrilateral. Quadrilateral. Yeah, I think it's quadrilateral. So then it can be a, a rhombus, a parallelogram, a trapezoid, a kite. Thank you, Paul, though. Uh, it's good to know uh, uh, you're listening. Cool. Ah, so where was I with that? Yeah, so four point correlation functions are quadrilaterals, a trapezoid is an example of such a quadrilateral, uh, bit of a four-sided figure. Yeah, quadrilateral. Um, great. I don't think I can put it off any longer. So let's get into unitarity. So just recapping where we are, we're talking about, we've got the framework, which is inflation, the fundamental principle, which is unitarity, and then how they relate together to to talk about something that's observable, observable, which is the correlation function. So we've talked about inflation, and we've talked about the observable, which is the correlation function. Now, the fundamental principle of unitarity, which they use in this paper to put everything together to get the predictions about the correlation functions, is not something I'm going to do a good job of explaining right now. So if you're watching this live or in the future, come back later on, and I'll have a better explanation of unitarity. So if you're watching this in the future, just search in the search uh, of, of videos from this channel and hopefully there'll be a better description of unitarity. What it has to do with is conservation of information or probability in the sense that something that is losing information might be non-unitary. And, and an example of that might be something like a a firm, uh, hmm, like a, a more, trying to, 
think of non-technical ways to explain this, but but a thermal physics would be something where you you stop caring about let's let's say we're talking about the thermal physics of, of a warm room. You stop caring about every single individual atom and where they're moving and how they're interacting, and you start talking about average properties of the universe uh, of the room. Too much universe on my mind. You stop talking about start talking about average properties of the room. And in that sense, you've lost information. You no longer know about the specific locations of, of everything. Now, at a fundamental level, the room is still obeying a unitary set of laws of physics in the sense that the locations of the particles aren't being lost to the universe. It's just being lost to your description. So your description is non-unitary, but the actual physics is still unitary. So that's the sort of loss of information sense. The, the, the conservation of probability sense is more of a very sort of quantum mechanical description of unitarity where, and I think this is where the term unitarity comes from, unit being one and unitarity meaning staying one, meaning that the probabilities remain adding up to one. But if you have a quantum mechanical description of, of a system, what you have is a bunch of states and each possible state of the system has some weighting attached to it, which gives a probability that it is in that state. So in that sense, unitarity is saying that as you evolve the whole system forwards in time, the sums of the probabilities of it being in state A or state B or state C or state D or however many states you need to describe this full system, that sum of probabilities remains one. Now, if quantum mechanics is true, it kind of has to remain one because otherwise, like otherwise it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's like, oh, if the probabilities don't add up to one, let's say they add up to 0.9, then there's a 0.1 probability that it's not in any of the states. And therefore, what what is it? Like it, there's a 0.1 probability that, I don't know, the universe ended, that God turned the simulation off. So this is kind of getting to maybe why unitarity is such a safe thing to assume as your fundamental principle that when you write down your quantum mechanical description of what's happening during inflation, the set of states that the universe might be in is still the set of states that the universe might be in, that it doesn't suddenly stop working halfway through. Now, I think I'm going to just move on and that's the best job I can give at the moment of explaining what unitarity is. In the video of Harry and Gordon's talk which i will actually just quickly put an actual link to in the comments so that people can look at it now and or in the, well maybe not now but people can certainly look at in the future they do go into a little bit more detail about unitarity and, and in particular why it is relevant to correlation functions and things but it's mathematical like it talks about the unitary evolution operator and if u dagger u equals one, why blah, 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 blah. So if those sorts of words aren't scaring you, check it out. Uh, I don't know the exact time when they go into it, but there is a table of contents. So at some point, the table of contents might, um, might talk about it. But anyway, I'm going to move on now to, yeah, the conclusion, which again, because we're talking about an individual paper, not a whole field of research that I am now summarizing for you with a wonderful answer. This conclusion is not, you know, earth shattering, but it does essentially say that if you assume unitarity during inflation, there are some conditions on correlation functions. Now, they're not conditions on the 2.3.4 point correlation functions I was talking about. They're conditions on some theoretical things that are related to the correlation function. So I think this is one of the things that is why this paper is not, you know, already being front page news of BBC News, CNN, blah, 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 because it's not the final word. So they have these things that are close to correlation functions. And then further research needs to get these conditions onto the actual observable things. Um, but it's essentially a relationship between the two point correlation. It is, well, there's actually lots of conditions they derive, but one particular condition they derive is a, the exact word is a simple and powerful relationship between psi three and psi four, or equivalently between the bispectrum and trispectrum. Bispectrum being the two point correlation function and trispectrum being the three point correlation function. And 
this specific paper took an earlier result that was derived and extended it to other possible expansion histories during inflation. So the earlier ones had assumed only an exponential expansion during inflation, which means that the size of the universe or the, the distances between two pieces of the universe is following an exponential function. So e to the power of h times t, that as time goes on, the distance is growing exponentially. But their new result essentially was able to show that the same consequences for the correlation functions will apply so long as you have an expanding universe that is flat. Now, I see it, we're at 56 minutes and flatness is not something that I can very quickly describe. It is essentially meaning that on equal time uh, snapshots of the universe that if you were to fix the time and move around spatially within the universe, distances do exactly what you expect in vanilla geometry, that parallel lines stay parallel, that triangles have angles that add up to 180 degrees. That's not necessarily always the case in general relativity and near black holes, it's certainly not the case. But it turns out that inflation makes the universe more flat. So the fact that their work shows that in a flat geometry or flat on equal time surfaces or where surfaces are three dimensions, I mean, sorry, three dimensional surfaces, uh, their result holds is good for them because that's, that's what happens during inflation. Uh, yeah, so, so that's the result that they're now able to show that this is true for other types of expansion, which is good because during inflation, it's not perfectly exponential. It's close to exponential, but not perfectly exponential. And therefore their results will still be valid during a normal type of inflation, not just this very specific type, which would have the exponential expansion. Further steps that need to be done before one is actually, you know, ruling out unitarity or inflation. And of course, you're probably actually ruling out inflation rather than unitarity if you if you manage to make an observation that violates the sort of rules that they're talking about, is to link it more closely to actual observations and also to, um, uh, what's the other thing? To, no, it's, it's jumped out of my mind at the moment. I will try and talk about that in a in another stream perhaps. But anyway, that, that, that's that's all I, I have time for to talk about that paper. I think the final thing to take away from my discussion of that particular paper is that these, cor these, these correlation functions, the, the knowledge about what the universe is like a certain distance away from another piece of the universe, which is something that totally can be measured, right? You can measure the density all over the, the universe that we can measure by how many galaxies there are. You know, if there are more galaxies, the density is higher. And then saying, okay, if, if there are more galaxies here, are there also more galaxies here or fewer galaxies off the camera? Sorry, down here. That's a correlation function. The thing to take away is that by measuring these correlation functions, we can actually be inferring some pretty fundamental stuff about the early universe. Without the work of people like Harry and Gordon, it was a very model dependent statement. You could say, oh, well, you're learning about this particular model of inflation. And then, oh, well, how many models of inflation are there? Well, you know, probably a few thousand. Oh, okay, well, okay. So I'm learning something about model number 634. Whoop-de-doo, that's exciting. But now this new work is able to say pretty fundamental stuff. If inflation is true, if the framework of inflation is true, and we were to measure one of these things, and this might not be happening for another five to 10 years that were actually all the pieces are finally in place you would then be saying the universe is or isn't unitary or inflation did or didn't occur. And so that's pretty cool. By measuring the correlation functions, you're learning stuff about the very early universe at energy densities that are way beyond anything we could see in the Large Hadron Collider or any future colliders. Like this is orders of magnitude more, not 10 times more or 100 times more or 1,000 times more, but m way more than that, higher in energy density than, than is possible even the fastest cosmic rays that hit our atmosphere. And we do measure these cosmic rays and it's really interesting to measure these cosmic rays. And the reason why, why, okay, first of all, even those cosmic rays aren't going as fast as one would be inferring about inflation by 
well, wouldn't be as high as the energy density of inflation. So learning about inflation is learning about higher energies. But these cosmic rays are super interesting things. And I hadn't planned to talk about them, but I am going to like, just for like a minute, talk about these super high energy cosmic rays. There, there are cosmic rays that are hitting the surface of our atmosphere at much, much, much larger energies than anything we can probe in something like the Large Hadron Collider. The reason why we're not immediately learning all about fundamental particle physics on much larger energy scales is that we don't have these gigantic, amazing detectors around the collision point. So, you know, this cosmic ray comes in and it hits some uh, atom in the atmosphere and does all sorts of wonderful decays into all sorts of wonderful particles that if we just happen to have one of the detectors that we have sitting around the Large Hadron Collider around that event, we would immediately learn so much cool stuff. Unfortunately, we don't because atmosphere is huge, right? We can't put detectors everywhere in the atmosphere. In fact, we but we do have detectors deep underground trying to, to learn this sort of stuff, right? Um, so that's another topic that's super interesting about how we might be learning about higher energies by having having huge detectors under the ground. Another thing, stick around and I'll talk about them in, in later streams. Um, but yeah, even then you wouldn't be getting to the energy scales that, that you're probing by, by looking at inflation. So, okay, I hope if you're watching this live or in the future that you enjoyed it. And thank you very much to all the people watching it live and watching it in the future for watching. Please do, whether you're seeing this on HEPS or on YouTube, like and subscribe. It will motivate me to carry on uh, and, and I'll feel that it is being appreciated. Also, please give feedback about what was clear and what wasn't and ask follow-up questions. Whether you're here right now live or whether you're watching it in the future, ask questions on YouTube or HEPS. I will see them. And while I probably won't reply in text, I do intend to have relatively frequent, frequently asked questions future streams. And I will certainly default to answering the questions that have been asked either on HEPS or on YouTube, because those are the people who are interacting with me. So I want to interact with them. I'll probably also look on Reddit and Stack Exchange for other questions that look interesting that people have, have asked and try and answer them. But here's your chance to get me answering things on stream by, by asking questions here in, in the comments. I hope to have some illustrations in future streams. So some of the stuff that I've been sort of waving around with my hands, probably a little bit helpful with the hands, but a figure might look even better. My idea is to build up to having these streams weekly. I can't promise at the moment that I'll be doing them weekly because I'm not in the habit of it yet. I don't have time super scheduled, but, but maybe famous last words, maybe I'll be doing this weekly from now onwards. It has been quite fun. Um, every two weeks, there's a new one of these technical cosmology talks. Talks. Uh, so every two weeks, I will be talking about the most recent one of them. Normally, they'll probably be more digestible than this. This really was an ambitious first one to deal with. Um, and so I haven't really even gone to the details about the paper uh, because unitarity was just too much of a obstacle. So in future ones, they will be more intelligible. And then... I'll get better at it. And eventually when we come across something super technical like this, I'll, I'll have a better go and I'll have stuff to back it up. But yeah, check out that channel and you'll see the topic that is likely to be the next thing when that video gets released, whatever the next stream I do here will be on that topic. And then, so that leaves a, a fourth week, right? If I am doing this every week, every two weeks we'll have um, a cosmology talk one, and then once a month, I'll have these sort of frequently asked questions streams. So in the remaining one, it'll be something miscellaneous. Maybe I'll interview someone. Maybe I will have discussions with other fundamental researchers on other topics. I quite like the idea of me talking to a neuroscientist and learning about neuroscience. I can be the general public for that and just ask all the dumb questions and the neuroscientist can answer them or, or other fundamental research. And maybe once in a while, I'll try and have a kind of state of cosmology update where I, me and others talk about exactly what it is, the problems that cosmologists are trying to solve and what progress has been made in say the last three months or six months. So individual papers that I'm talking about regularly will be the, the kind of trenches of cosmology, but then what are those trenches trying to build um, and, and what progress has been made so that there is that kind of satisfying sense of, okay, well, three months ago, we talked about the Hubble tension and how Maybe the late universe was the more difficult thing. And now three months later, actually, it looks like the early universe is the more difficult thing. You can hopefully, by watching them, see some sort of sense of progress in cosmology research that you won't see by either just 
getting the super well packaged Brian Cox documentary and also won't get by learning about individual papers because they're not kind of looking at the bigger picture. Although some are like those Georgia Statia ones I was showing right at the beginning are, are kind of looking at the bigger picture, but they're also not really like orthodox papers. They're more Georgia Statio's blog, very technical blog, but blog about cosmology uh, put on PDF format. Um, Awesome. And I think once there are highlights, so once I think I have put extra care into an explanation, so let's say I go away and think about unitarity and come up with some illustrations or very good, very well thought through description of what unitarity is, I might make a highlight and then there'll be a separate YouTube channel with the, the, the highlights of, of things that show up in these streams. Other than that, that's all. Thank you for, for watching and see you again next week or sometime soon after that.